Uh, town Council reports and correspondence. Jessica. Yes, um, uh, Chairman Sherman, I have several, um, several items. Um, first of all, uh, we have a vacancy still for the Thomas Memorial Library Board of Trustees. We have a vacancy for the Planning Board. Application deadline for these uh, positions, uh, uh, the uh, deadline is this Friday, May 13th, so we hope that we will receive applications for these positions. Um, also, I'd like to announce uh, that on May 26th, there is a public forum for the Open Space and Greenbelt Management draft plan. This plan is going to be presented. Uh, it's online already, I believe. Pardon? Parts of it. <laughs> anyway, it will soon all be online. But um, the uh, Open Space and Greenbelt Management Committee is presenting this to the Town Council formally in June. But we want very much to have public input. And that opportunity is uh, May 26 here in Chambers at 7 p.m. Just to let you know, if you don't already, or as a reminder, the town owns over 923 acres of open space, over 16 miles of Greenbelt trails. And the committee's been working very hard to come up with written management policies for all of this space. So we really hope that the public comes and um, offers their comments and ideas for us. Um, the other uh, item is on tonight's agenda, um, Chairman Sherman, 920, no, I'm sorry, 92-2011. I had asked, I had asked last week that that be tabled till June, if if that could be. I I think perhaps when we reach that agenda item, we could, you could just make a motion to table at that point. Thank you. Okay. Any other town, uh, Jim? Just that the ordinance committee is working on the on the uh, growth areas in town, and the meeting is scheduled for uh, the 18th. Uh, we have our next ordinance committee meeting, and we have uh, hopefully will at that point wrap up our discussions and our evaluation of uh, the issues that surround the growth here in town, with some recommendations to the town council meeting in June. And uh, again, I'd encourage uh, citizens who are interested in that subject to. Uh, to um, come to the meeting on the 18th, and um, my hope is that we'll have something for the Town Council to deal with in June. Thank you. Sarah. I'd like to remind everyone that tomorrow's Election Day, um, two things are on the ballot. One is the Senate race for District 7 uh, to fill Larry Bliss's vacated spot, and the other is the school board referendum. So I would encourage everyone, every, everyone in town to vote. Uh, polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, in the high school gym. Anyone else? I, I did just want to mention that the town lost two uh, dedicated volunteers in the last couple of weeks. Uh, Alan Rowe uh, recently passed away. He was a longtime community volunteer, uh, was captain of Fire Engine One Company, and a longtime volunteer firefighter. Also noteworthy is he's the father of uh, Jim Rowe, who served on the council, and Priscilla Rowe. So the community. Uh, on behalf of the council, I send that family our condolences. Uh, we also lost Tom LaProd. Uh, Tom served on the Zoning Board of Appeals and was also its chair. Uh, he also served on the Thomas Memorial Board of Trustees and I think for over 14 years coached Little League Baseball. Um, and uh, again, we send the LaProd family our condolences. Uh, this is the first opportunity uh, this evening for uh, citizens to uh, comment on items that are not on tonight's agenda. If anybody would like to speak to an issue not on the agenda, please come forward to the podium, identify yourself, and uh, you feel free to offer your comments. Okay, seeing none, I'll ask the town manager for his report. Yes, thank you, David. I wanted to briefly update the council on the New England Cottontail at, at Fort Williams Park. Uh, we've been continuing to have uh, very cooperative discussions with the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Uh, the, the department has agreed uh, that any mitigation requirements will be only going forward, not declaring that that has already been done. Uh, so that's a, a very positive uh, move, and we're, we're working now with uh, the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife to identify uh, a, a site that would be a habitat for them uh, to allow other plans to continue to go on at Fort Williams Park, as has been planned. So 
the, the state's been very cooperative and we appreciate uh, uh, their assistance as we uh, resolve some of these issues. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Deborah, before we turn this over to Matt Sturgis, did you have any other uh, information to offer regarding tomorrow's election? Uh, as Sarah said, the polls are open from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. Everyone votes at the high school gymnasium. I would just like to take a minute to thank everyone for their help. No matter what the size of the election, um, it's quite an undertaking because of the absentee ballot process the way it is. I'd like to specifically thank Scott Berry and April Cohen Tracy for coming in to help us. Uh, our, town clerk, our deputy town clerk, Jackie Coy, and her husband actually are still working and will be for a while longer getting ready for tomorrow. So again, I would um, be remiss if I did not thank those folks for their help uh, as we approach tomorrow. So again, we'll be at the high school gymnasium, uh, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, the town manager had suggested, and I thought it was a good idea, to invite uh, Matt Sturgis to tonight's meeting to give us an update on the reevaluation. <coughs> Greetings, council members. Nice to see you this evening. I'll try to be brief uh, and give you an update as to where we are. Obviously, uh, over the weekend, probably Friday and through our Saturday, we received notification from the town of an increase in the assessment value of your, of your house. Uh, in some cases, it was a large increase. In some cases, it wasn't so much of an increase. Uh, I'm here tonight to kind of report on the results of over a year's worth of effort to update the assessments for the town. First of all, uh, a little bit of background. The Cape Elizabeth assessment history, uh, and I brought the, the magic of PowerPoint with me tonight uh, to help, to help uh, convey my message, but the last in-house revaluation was performed in 2003. So it's been eight years since we have done an in-house update, and this is the most recent one for 2011. Both of them were performed in-house, it's important to stress, at a much reduced cost as it would have been to have actually hired an outside firm. Uh, we had substantial savings and this project actually did come in and I, I forecast to come in significantly under budget from before. So it's a large undertaking and, and cost effective. The goals that we had at the outset of this project was primarily the equalization of the tax burden between properties and, different, and disparate property classes within the town. We also wanted to maintain compliance with state law and that was in concert with the equalization concept, as well as follow the directive of the Maine Constitution, which states that all taxes upon real and personal property shall be apportioned and assessed equally according to the just value thereof. Ultimately, that, and the state has gone above and beyond that to establish minimum standards. Uh, the primary one here, uh, ultimately, is a minimum of 70% assessment ratio, but that is exactly the bare minimum. We were actually overall above that minimum amount, but our significant problem was equity between different neighborhoods ultimately in town and different classes of property, such as uh, waterfront versus some inland properties and differences between neighborhoods. Now, it's important to note that a revaluation does not raise new revenue for the town. Uh, that's one misconception that a lot of folks look at. They say, wow, well, look at that new number and they understand you know, two weeks ago or uh, three weeks ago the budget was passed and they look at the tax rate that was forecast and they get sticker shock but this is actually revenue neutral in many ways and what I, what I mean by that is with the assessed value of the town increasing the actual tax rate decreases and that's why you may have seen on your revaluation notice instead of the eighteen dollars and twenty eight cents that was forecast at the end of the budget process for the town side it actually brought forward a $15.18 estimated tax rate. So it dropped $3.10. I will say that uh, that was a conservative estimate, and I do foresee that that will actually be a bit lower than that, but I won't actually have a full actu actual number until the hearings and the revaluation reviews are, are completed and we go to commitment in, in August. So. Uh, but the purpose of a revaluation ultimately is to value all properties according to the same standard or trying to get them all at about the same level of assessed value in relationship to their market value. Now, uh, just value is defined in a sense by law as based on market value. It doesn't always mean market value because 
you, know, you do a revaluation one year, and the next year the market could move up, it could move down. So just value is actually how that property sits in relationship to the other properties assessed, assessed within the community. So you could be at, your just value could be at, like this year, 80% of market value. That is actually just value for the town. It's a little confusing, but uh, it's, it's one that kind of gets mixed up at times. And it's also important to note that price does not always equate to market value. Case in point would be if you bought a property or, uh, or a property at a discounted or a, dis a distressed sale, such as an auction. Whereas the sale price may be significantly less than what the value of that property is, but it's still a price. The value may be something considerably higher than that. Well, the, the converse of that, of course, is you could overpay. Or you might have paid for something at the peak of a market, and the, the price at that point might be higher than what the value actually is today. So we try to reconcile those two concepts of price and value. A good example of this may be uh, looking at market value as the actual selling price when as long as you know, both parties involved, meaning the buyer and the seller, are both knowledgeable, so they each know what they're, one knows what he's getting rid of, and the other one knows, or she may know what she's actually getting in exchange. One way to look at it is if you go to a car lot, and you have six identical cars, and they're all selling for about $20,000, or their sticker price is $20,000. Well, one sells for $19,000, one sells for eighteen five, one sells for seventeen seven. What then you look at is the average selling price, and that kind of gives you what the what the value may be is actually about e the average of those. Um, at about eighteen thousand four hundred would be what you could expect to to pay for a car of comparable property of comparable quality. Looking at those sales, so that's kind of a kind of a good you know, easy way to break it down. Uh, what we've seen recently in the past, or since basically from the peak market, which I ultimately was. I'd identify as 2007 was the market has actually pulled back some. I guess that's no surprise to, to most of us if you look at or look at the paper or, or watch the news or have refinanced your home, you've seen you know that there have been has been a reduction. Uh, I would say that overall, you know, since the, over the four years of five, the five-year study here, you know, 11% drop is about what I had seen looking at the numbers. That's kind of what. Has held, has held firm from 2007 to now versus in other sections of the country where you see on you know, basically headline news or some kind of large dramatic headline is that a market had collapsed. Think of South Florida, think of California, think of Providence, Rhode Island, think of you know, whatever town USA may have been a boom or bust cycle. It hasn't quite exactly been the case that we found in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, it has declined but not significantly in relationship to the horror stories that you've read elsewhere. So that's uh, important to note. And you know, also, looking at the change in assessments, a lot of folks can say, well, how can you do a revaluation during a down period in the market? It actually you know, still shows that we're approximately 22% below what full market value is when you look at the, at the actual ratios of assessed values to sale properties. So we still, even with that change in the market, have found that there was a 22% difference between the overall average sales. So that is part of the, part of the reason why we balance that out. Now, the effect of this revaluation is that you're going to find that taxpayers whose current value is 75% or less of market value. So say that if, if the house sold for, say, $100,000, and it was a yeah, seventy-four thousand dollars assessment. Their property value tax or their property taxes will show an increase. So if they're less than, or if they're more than twenty-five percent away from market value, their taxes will probably increase. If you have an assessment that's you know, closer to full value or within twenty-five percent of its market value, you're probably not going to see a change. If any, it's going to be a very slight one. And those whose market value is, you know, really less than that are going to see a tax decrease. Now, uh, this kind of gives you a breakdown of how the tax rate calculation took place, as I, as I talked about earlier, how it, how it actually drops. The uh, amount to be raised this year based on the town and school budgets and county uh, budget as well as to satisfy uh, community services was at this point in time $24,937,320. 
Now that's based, that tax rate is based on a current or the last year's, uh, or I guess what we have for this year, we'd be carrying forward without a revaluation of a billion, 365 million estimated value, resulting in an $18.27 rate per thousand tax rate. Now, with the new assessed value, you have the same amount net to be raised, but the new assessed value of the town is a million, a billion, six hundred and forty-two million seven hundred and seventy-four thousand seven hundred, which results in a fifteen dollar and eighteen cent estimated tax rate. Now, what that, what the net amount of that really means is that there's about a seventeen percent reduction in the tax rate from what it was forecast to what it, what it could be. It may be, like I say, it may even be greater than that when we finally get to the final numbers in the in the summer when we go to commitment. And the overall value increase for the town was 20%. Now, why do you say, you know, if we increase by 20%, why is the tax rate only going down to 17%? Well, the net, uh, the net difference between the fiscal year 2011 and fiscal year 2012 budget increase was actually 3.7%. And the net income increase to median single-family homes was approximately 2.6%. So, the tax, or the overall spending increase offset a little bit of that overall value increase in town, so it was consistent with where it should be. Now, uh, I gave a couple of different estimates here based on the previous median single-family home and the, what the, uh, the new single-family median home would be. Uh, based on last year's numbers, or fiscal year 2011's numbers, the median single-family home was approximately $258,000, and it carried about a $4,716 tax bill. Going forward with this year, the median is about $318,900, with an estimated tax rate, a tax bill of about $4,840. And that, that shows that increase, the net that took place with the increase in spending. Now, I, I chose the median, because quite frankly, that is the dead midpoint of the whole, uh, of all single family homes in town. Half of them are above them and half of them are below them. So that gives you the exact point of, point of match where, where it's good to balance and, and estimate from. Over the years, uh, councils and, and school boards have gone and used the median in their analysis to try to figure out how the estimate of impact would be on, a, on you know, Mr. and Mrs. Median Homeowner in Cape Elizabeth, Maine. Now, you'll see that the median assessed value changed approximately 24.73%. Now, as a result of this project, approximately 29% or accurate or at exactly 1,269 will, will see their property taxes decrease. The largest share of increased values were between a part of the core of all the properties in town were, were basically between 20% and 30% increase in value, so they're right around that, that, that median increase. And that's approximately 30% or 1,313 properties. And then the net tax uh, increase on those properties is going to basically range between 3 to 13% increase in taxes. Now there are... Uh, this is kind of a breakdown of the overall property value changes as far as the numbers. As you'll see, uh, the low ends, of course, are on the extreme. Those are the outliers. But, for instance, on the far left, 216 properties basically had a 0% change to so, uh, less than 10%. And then if you look on the high end on the right, uh, there was an increase of over 55% on about 231 properties. I looked at that the first time and said, wow, on both ends, but realized on some of them there were uh, properties that uh, may have had, a, you know, I may have repriced land because it might have been a wetland issue or something like that that might have been overvalued. Uh, they might have taken a house down, demolished a house, and it was not there April 1st, so that house was taken off the record, so it just had a land value, so it showed a significant change. On the opposite end of the spectrum, there were homes that increased significantly or greater than 55%, which I think is a heck of a lot. Uh, and that was primarily driven by a home being added to a lot. Uh, or uh, Eastman Meadows, for instance, has six new condos that were added this year, plus the land. So that went from actually, uh, a, you know, if you look at it, it was a new created lot for this year, so it was 100% plus pickup. Uh, or there were new ho homes that may have been built in Cross Hill. There's a couple of large homes in there that were added that the home values were significantly greater than what the land value they were assessed at last year was. So they had uh, 
a large percentage increase. And what you'll see in the middle there, ultimately uh, the big, the, the core of them are basically from 15% to about 35% uh, and that those are the high numbers from, you know, four, ranging at 460 from an increase of four, 15 to 20% and then the high at 668 is in the 20 to 25% change so that's right where your median is sitting so it just kind of gives you a breakdown as to where the, the bulk of the changes took place in town. Now I have a number of sample assessments uh, I didn't specifically identify the property themselves because, uh, quite frankly, I don't think that's the direction I want to go in, but it kind of gives you an idea of the flavor for certain sections of town where I had uh, changes. So I just named the road, uh, quite honestly. Uh, this, this property, for instance, in 2010, last year's tax bill, was assessed at 312500 but in 2009 it sold for $610,000. Uh, the assessment percentage was 51%. Now the 2011 assessed value brought it up to $536,000 and that brings it to an assessment percentage of about 88%. You say, why isn't it 100% of full market value? Well, I still think, you know, there is some potential, that there may be some weakness in that, in that segment of the market and I try to build that in looking at not just one sale because this isn't California and we don't have Proposition 13 that you don't all of a sudden assess the properties instantly for what they sell for. So what I do is ultimately mass appraisal, and I'm trying to use a lot of data to figure out the value for a lot of properties, and not looking at one house and using three sales like you would on a single family home appraisal and knowing what that exact value is for that property. So I try to, uh, I try to give you an idea as to what the weight is on that. I had another home that sold on Oakhurst in 2010. It was assessed at 221000 it went up to, or sold for 327,500. The assessment percentage was 67 and a half percent. Now this year it's going to 321,600 with a ratio of 98 percent of full market value. Uh, in Brentwood, for instance, on Phillip Road, a house was at $210,000 assessment last year with a sale price of 250. So that is actually at 80 percent. That's greater than the median. This house will most likely see its taxes go down this year as a result of it being overvalued with a new assessment of 237.1. Pilot Point Road had a home and what, with a water view and it sold, it, uh, sold for 689, was assessed at 535.3 and it's gone up to 633.3. So it's changed, changed that gap, but it'll actually see its taxes go down as a result of it. Uh, in Broad Cove, for instance, which has been uh, uh, in my opinion, a neighborhood in town that has actually been undervalued, uh, I'm sorry, paying more than its fair share for at least three to four years. This house here sold, for instance, for, uh, for 310000 with an assessment of 266.3, and now it's going to be assessed at 299.6. It's actually, it was assessed before at 86%, now it's going to be at 97%. So I'm trying to, just to show you how it, across town, Ultimately, what we're trying to do is balance that equity. You can see, I gave you a couple of prime examples of where the equity was out of balance and other areas of town where it was out of balance. And, and in one neighborhood, Brentwood, for instance, where it was pretty darn close to, to being in balance. So, yeah, some we're going to see the property taxes go up, some will see them go down, and some will see them stay up. <coughs> a, uh, a few more final points before I wrap up. Uh, the assessment system has been upgraded, uh, meaning that the cost tables have been updated to the current cost schedules. I use a, uh, a company called Marshall Valuation, which is a national uh, national valuation estimating book, and use that to update my cost my cost tables within my software and try to bring up what the cost of, to reproduce or uh, replace a house, not reproduce it, but to replace it. Um, so that brought that up the cost tables by about 20 percent, more or less, on your average home. Land values were updated based on the current sales. So what I did was analysis in every on, in every neighborhood on every map. I looked at every sale that took place. Over, I had I had a basis of 350 sales, but that expanded to well over 400 sales because I had to expand my time period and some others uh, some other uh, parts of the analysis. I actually found that the 2004-2005 market was very similar to today's market versus 2006 and 2007 where I think prices really ramped up 
uh, saw the most growth. So I, I may look at those sales, but I, get, I would discount them in the, in the event that I saw that that was all I had. So I tried to figure out what the factor of, of the discount rate should be. Now, we do have the new values, and they are posted on the assessment page. I had a problem for about a day and a half of getting those booted up to the online search engine, but they are there. I've verified that again, uh, much to my chagrin and apologies that they didn't come on when I anticipated them to, but uh, electronics are a great thing. Sometimes they are not, uh, but, but they are out there now. We also have our maps and our database available online, so if folks want to go and look at their assessment, look at their property, look at their neighbor's property, look at a property across town that has no relevance whatsoever to their assessment, go for it. We want to have that out there. Uh, everything I do, we try to have it in a clean and open book, so it, it's open to public scrutiny. And then uh, I would, one recommendation I would come out from this experience and looking at the amount of change that may have to take or does take place between properties is I'd recommend doing this probably more on a three to four year interval. Uh, rather than waiting. I know this this is kind of an extreme case because the market took off and came back, so we kind of had, you know, eerily similar to back six years ago, uh, but I'm really glad I didn't do it in 07 because we'd be back, I would be doing it today, revising it. A couple of towns are doing that right now, and, and Wyndham and Freeport have, have revised their assessments, so I think we're in good stead as far as their overall, but I think going forward, it'd be best to do them on a more regular basis because then the extremes and the changes aren't, aren't as much. Now, uh, my schedule for this was for the past year plus. I did uh, my analysis computer entry. Uh, I did my review and analysis over the past 13 months. On May 1st, I set the values for what they're going to be uh, for, the, for the notices. We mailed the notices on the 5th. Uh, informal hearings are going to begin on the 24th, and all my notices show the number that they can call to schedule appointments and our support staff is more than willing and happy to do it. And then in August we'll go to commitment with the final values. Finally, I'd like to just, uh, you know, I'm the assessor, but I have a couple of ladies who work in our office I share happily with the planner and with the code enforcement officer. Uh, Ani Kovarati is our office manager and Janet Moran is also our support staff. And uh, they do uh, a lot of great work and they're happy to schedule appointments for anybody who'd like to get in and take a look at that. So. With that being said, uh, thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Matt, thank you very much for uh, that summary. Uh, I, I think normally the council may have questions, but I, I, I'm mindful of the fact that we have a lot of people here to, to speak on uh, the short road pathway and other issues perhaps. But before we let Matt go, does anybody have any questions now that I've thoroughly discouraged them? <laughs> well, email. No, I, just a comment. Go ahead, Jim. I think that I think the review with an eight-year disparity here and having that length of time, uh, there are states like Massachusetts that require by state law every three years to look at your assessment. So I, I think it's I think it's a, it's wise for us to to consider that as a as a as a going forward plan because uh, you know these disparities in certain sections of town were enormous. I think it's, for planning purposes, for all of us, you know, I think if it's closer to to a three-year time frame, I think it's going to be the best interest of citizens here in Cape Elizabeth. And we're very fortunate to have uh, you available to do these in-house, so we're not incurring that uh, expense. So again, thank you for all your uh, hard work on this, Matt. We're happy to. It's, it's going to be great. Uh, it's a great experience, and I, I just want to reinforce the fact that assessing and appraisal of real estate is not an exact science. <laughs> It's very much uh, a, a fluid discipline, if you will, if you can call it a discipline. And it's something that I know that I didn't, I didn't come pre-programmed with all the answers to what properties are worth in the town of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, I've got a pretty good feeling what my own house is worth. And I think a lot of folks who live in the town have a really good feeling for what their houses are worth. So I welcome the hearings because it's like having an additional 9,000 eyes on, on a product that I came forward with. And I, I relatively don't take my feelings uh, uh, gently, so it's, it's, uh, it's good. But I look forward to the hearing process and moving forward. But I thank you very much for having me. Right, thanks a lot, Matt. Uh, next on the agenda is a review of the minutes from our April 11th and April 25th meetings. Do I have a motion? Uh, Sarah? I move we approve the minutes from April 11th and April 25th, 2011. Second. Yeah, the motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Jessica? Yes. On the uh, April 11 minutes, item 66 on page 4, um, 
<clears throat> it's just a, I think, a semantic error, but Mr. Hubner has performed wedding ceremonies. I just, if he's a minister, that's okay, but if he's not, perhaps he organized ceremonies. I thought he worked more as a facility organizer for some of those events. Or maybe I'm incorrect. Go ahead, He was the, uh, the musician. He performed at ceremonies. Okay, but it says has performed wedding ceremonies. Right. Well, I'm just saying, I'm just clarifying <laughs> for just you what he did. So we get to add the word at yeah. uh, before <laughs> wedding ceremonies. Okay, so yeah. with that modification, who made the motion you accept that? Yes. Uh, okay. Any other comments? All those in favor of the motion? Motion carries. Thank you. Um, the first item is 88-2011, the Shore Road Pathway. Uh, I thought it might be helpful before uh, I, I see there are a lot of people here that uh, may want to speak. This is not actually advertised as a public hearing, but our town council rules do allow for up to 15 minutes of public comment. So we'll certainly allow that opportunity uh, to occur. But I thought it might be useful for the town manager just to sort of summarize the, uh, the materials that are in our packet tonight and also perhaps just give a very brief uh, uh, history, if you will, of sort of how we got to today. Mike? Yes, thanks, uh, David. 73 months ago, the town council formed a roadway safety working group uh, back in 2006. That committee had a number of public forums reported out in 2007 and recommended that a shore road pathway committee be formed. Uh, the Shore Road Path Committee was subsequently formed in 2007 and in 2009 recommended to the Town Council that there be a pathway along Shore Road extending from the Town Center to Fort Williams Park. In uh, September of 2009, the Council endorsed uh, a concept plan for the Shore Road Path that had been recommended by the Shore Road Path Committee and the Council agreed to fund initial permitting surveying and design, it was $110,000 at that point. Uh, subsequently, the, the permitting has all occurred, the surveying, the design. Uh, there were also a couple of authorizations to apply for grants from other sources. Uh, one of those grants was successful. Uh, it was true, it is true, the Quality Communities Program of the Maine Department of Transportation, and in large part that's due to uh, work of all of these different citizen committees. It's due to the support that's been shown by local citizens in helping to fundraise for it. And, uh, you know, I think also notably the work of the town planner, uh, Maureen O'Meara, who prepared quite a bit of materials uh, for that grant. Uh, at this point, uh, there are sufficient funds available uh, for the actual construction of the path uh, from all different sources. However, uh, when you look at the contingency that you need for a project of this size, uh, you need to have some, some funds available up front for that. Uh, the estimated value of the project, according to MDOT at this point, is $937,000. If you add contingency, it's about $1,030,000. One uh, it's proposed the project be funded uh, with the MDOT grant with uh, monies that were set aside quite some time ago for the town center sidewalk where <coughs> which this path ends up uh, becoming part of. Uh, out of. Out of the 110,000 that was appropriated in 2009, there's 26,000 left. Uh, PACS, which is a regional transportation planning and funding agency, it gave Cape Elizabeth a $40,000 credit that could only be used for, for this project under their rules. It, would, it had to be one that considered in the biennium, that's 40,000. Uh, there's been uh, approximately $100,000 raised uh, from the private fundraising group. And that leaves, it, including the contingency, it leaves at 75,000 short. Uh, my, my recommendation to the town council is that that be funded from the infrastructure improvement fund. The infrastructure improvement fund uh, comes from building permit income was specifically set up to pay for building infrastructure. Uh, is, is not tax money, it is a separate, uh, a separate fund uh, specifically established for municipal infrastructure. Okay, all right, thank you, Mike. Uh, at this point, uh, if anybody would like to speak uh, on, the, on this agenda item, uh, please uh, come to the podium. If there are others uh, besides our first speaker, please line up behind her. 
Uh, we do have a total of 50 minutes set aside for this, uh, so we'll see how far we get, and then the council can evaluate whether we keep going for public comment. But with that in mind. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Marianne Lynch. I am an abutter, um, and I was here at the beginning of this project. I served on the council at that time, and I dearly wanted to be here tonight to see your final vote. I'm grateful for the work of the Citizens Committee and especially the work of Maureen O'Meara. I just wanted to mention a few points. The path will be located entirely in the public way. There will be no taking of private property. It requires no new tax dollars. We are fortunate, as was mentioned, to have a very large MDOC grant. And my only regret about this project is that my children are grown and will not have the pleasure of walking to school or walking to Fort Williams. So I urge your um, affirmative vote of this project that has been planned for many, many years and has uh, benefited from the participation of many citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bill Downs. I live at 15 Oak Colony Lane. I have just a couple of questions. The first is, I am assuming that you will approve this project today. Do you have any indication of the timing as to when you will put this into the budget so that the public can comment on it going forward? Or would you anticipate that you would wait until you get notification from the state or the federal government that the funds are available? Sir, I could ask the town manager to respond to that question. You would do it now? Sure. Yeah, the, the funds are expected to be available July 1. However, there is a recommendation that there may be some funds available prior to July 1. So it's, a, it's an immediate thing. They're waiting, the state is waiting for a commitment from us to indicate that the local match is ready and the project's ready to go. Okay, so per the town charter, when would this fit into the budget cycle where if you're adding a new capital expenditure? Per the town charter, if you look at the 2009 vote of the town council, yeah. it specifically authorized a project of this size so that that was the opportunity for a referendum in 2009. It specifically authorized the project of this size. Okay. My second question is, is that from the inception of the whole planning process for the path, it was stated in February of 2008 that because of the rugged terrain, the plan would not conform to ADA guidelines. Essentially, that ruggedness has not gone away, and the plan has not changed, yet it specifies within the application for the, for the grant that it must comply with all the ADA guidelines. I, I see a conflict there, and how do we get from point A to point B? Yeah, Mike, if you would be willing. Yeah, the, the state does review the plans for ADA compliance. They will be reviewing all the plans. And, you know, the, the ADA requirements don't require that every inch of it be ADA compliant. What it requires is that there be segments of it that everyone can enjoy, regardless of any disability that they may have. Okay. Hypothetical. Assuming for state purposes that they state that we comply, but state, assume that the feds come in after the fact and it's constructed and they state that it doesn't comply. What are the consequences to the town? Is, is there any estimate of what it would cost to comply exactly with the provisions of the guidelines? Yeah, go ahead. When the state reviews the plans, they work very closely with the Federal Highway Administration. All, all of the, the state MDOT coordinates 100% uh, with Federal Highway. Okay. And the plans are reviewed at the same time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Would, would anybody else like to speak? Good evening, uh, Nelson Silva from 11 Old Colony Lane. And uh, I have a few questions. Um, when this project first started, um, the committee, a safe access for everyone, was going to raise $200,000. And uh, they were given until October of this year to come up with that money. Uh, the town planner had made mention back uh, last year that if the matching funds were not available by October of this year, then the town council would have the right to re-examine the grant and whether or not they'd accept it or come up with other funding. Uh, 
so it was supposed to be a 20-80% match. Uh, looking at the numbers you have tonight to make the sh up the shortfall, it's not only the 75,000, but it's a 60,000 from sidewalk, uh, 26,000, uh, the remaining balance from uh, another budget, and the 40,000 from PACs. Now last year, 110,000 was used to pay for, as you said, uh, for the surveying, permitting, and so forth. And that money came out of uh, 74000 out of the fund, uh, bond fund for town center in 2008, plus another, another 26000 or 36000 out of the sidewalk fund. Did we get the 40000 grant that we applied for to complete the sidewalk from the town center corner to the Murray property, which, can, which will then connect to the pathway? Yes, we did. Okay. Good. Okay. So that, that 40000 for PACS program will go against that. Okay, fine. But that still leaves about 126000 that's being appropriated tonight from town funds to make up for the shortfall on top of the 110000 of town funds that were used to pay for the permitting, which is like $236,000 roughly, which is over 20% of the total cost of this program. The original deal was 20% match from private funds, 80% match from the state. Why can't we give the committee until October to come up with 100,000 or short on, if that's what they're short on? That's my question. Thank you, sir. Thank you. My name is Heather Altenberg. I also live on Old Colony Lane, number 31. Uh, I have three children, eight, six, and four, and it's a wonderful neighborhood, but we are essentially locked into there. My kids cannot go to t-ball or baseball, which is a quarter of a mile away, without getting in the car. They cannot go to school without getting in the car, um, and I just wanted to put on the record that I am enthusiastically in support of this pathway to create a more active, healthier um, united community. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Piper Strunk and I'm in third grade. Hi, I'm Kelly Mahoney and I'm in third grade also. We ride the bus to school every day. When we get there, we see Carly Chapin and Julia Florak walking to school. We live close enough to school. We can walk. We can walk and ride our bikes. But we cannot do it safely. Please vote yes to build the pathway and keep kids safe. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Jim Kearney, uh, 1015 Shore Road. I'm also the uh, co-chairman and the treasurer of SAFE, SAFE Access for Everyone. I want to give you a report on our efforts and the community's efforts on where we are so far. So we've had, uh, I believe we've had overwhelming and diverse support for this uh, project. Our uh, fundraising efforts have gone very, very well. From a diversity perspective, we've had kids emptying their piggy banks in support of the uh, project. We've had uh, folks at Walk Shore Road on a daily basis giving money for every walk that they take. We've had Beach to Beacon runners. Beach to Beacon itself has given uh, a couple local contractors. Um, we've had over, uh, I think, 220 gifts that have been under $100, kind of showing that kind of level of support, but also a dozen or so gifts that are uh, well over $1,000. So we've had a uh, great base of support, and to that end, the uh, SAFE committee, in support of the Shore Road Pathway, is uh, thrilled to be able to offer the town in excess of $100,000. So I checked the mail today. There are still checks coming in, and uh, we feel we've made uh, great progress and look forward to the continued support of the uh, council uh, for the Shore Road Pathway. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Karen Holmes, and I live at 27 Old Colony Lane. I um, lived there for about eight years with my husband and two children. And um, so I've had a lot of mixed emotions about um, the path ever since I heard about it uh, a couple years ago now, and I, I still do. Um, sorry, I, I wrote something up, and I guess I'll just read it, but um, 
I don't usually like to speak in public, and I think I have a lot of neighbors and friends who um, I don't want to disappoint. Uh, so when we bought our house, we bought our house for the same reasons that everybody buys their house, and that is because they think that um, it's, it's, the mo it's the best place to raise their family. And when we found Old Colony Lane, we found a mix of a lovely neighborhood with that, uh, also that lovely rural feeling. So it was a lovely mix, and I think that most people would agree that uni uh, Old Colony Lane is quite unique in what we have to, what we, what we, in the environment we live in. Um, and so, uh, as as the ch my children got older, um, we had the benefit of using Robinson Woods to get us to the places we wanted to go, and that meant um, going up through uh, behind the Methodist Church, Methodist Church, and ending up at 77. And that was, um, that's always been great for us, and we enjoy cross-country skiing and biking and walking and all the things that we know we need to do because we all agree the shore road is not safe for us or our kids. Um, my husband, by the way, is a runner, and he does run shore road, and he does have to step off to the side of the road when, when cars are heading for him, and so I do appreciate the dangers that the runners face. Um, however, when I listen to people talk about how they can't wait for this path or they're sorry that their own children weren't able to use a path because they're now grown, I have to ask myself at what age they feel that their kids would be perfectly safe stepping out onto a path um, that, um, about Shore Road. Um, my kids are 10 and 13, and I think, yes, both of them I would allow to come out of Shore Road and take a right and head up to school. Uh, the reality is my 10 and 13-year-olds carry backpacks and they carry uh, instruments, musical instruments, and they carry laptops, and they carry um, sports equipment and the reality of them really using the path on a regular basis I don't I don't really see as realistic and then I think about them coming out of um, Old Oconee Lane and taking a left and I'm not sure I would ever feel safe I don't care how old they were um, walking to Fort Williams because in my opinion so long as there are people who speed and there are blind curves and there are people um, on if their you could cell just, phones. We just have a few more seconds. Okay. To wrap. And there are people talking on their cell phones. I, I'm just not certain Shore Road will ever be safe. And so when people use the word safe, um, I just I just wonder if they might think a little deeper about the reality of what of what they're stepping out onto, no matter what is out there. All right. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jim Tassi. I live at 30 Cliff Avenue in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I've been involved with the SAFE Committee uh, for about a year and a half, two years now. Um, it's been exciting to see this project develop and get support. Um, with respect to some of the comments that were just made, I would just like to remind the Council that according to AASHTO, the American Association of uh, Highway and Traffic Officials, uh, pedestrians are always safer where there is a side path or a sidewalk available. So there is no question that this project will materially improve the safety of Shore Road in addition to improving the walkability and the livability of our town. Um, I'm very excited at the uh, prospect of this project going forward and I hope you will support it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Ingrid Salvador and I live at 24 Wood Road and I, wish, I just wish you would vote yes for the path because me and my brother would use it a lot and and um and so we hope you vote yes thank you uh we have about a minute and a half left of the 15 minutes uh oh i shouldn't have said that yeah. it's coming <laughs> It's now a minute and 10 seconds. Okay. <laughs> Hi. I'm Tom McInerney. I live at 29 Old Fort Road. I'm in favor of this 100%. I'm a physician uh, on Spurwink Ave, and every day I take out a baseball bat and hit people over the head and say, you got to walk more, you got to run more, you got to exercise more. And I think this will be a great pathway which will help me do my job better and keep my patients and the uh, citizens of Cape Elizabeth a little healthier. So, is that quick enough? <laughs> Thank you, Tom. <laughs> Yes, please. Hi, I'm Terry Patterson. I live at 15 Surf Road. These are my little guys sitting in the front. Um, I just want to fully support this. I hope you guys all can vote yes. Um, I've got two boys with a lot of energy, and the, the more that I can get them on a bike and get them moving, 
hopefully towards school rather than away from school, is good. So thank you for your support. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Max Patterson, and I hope everyone will vote yes for the pathway. Thank you. Uh, I, we are up about to the 15-minute mark. Um, if anybody just feels they haven't had a chance, <coughs> could you raise your hand? Otherwise, I think we, we ought to move forward with discussion. <coughs> okay, thanks. Uh, at this point, I would open it up to council members for discussion, comments, or a motion. Sarah. Do you want a motion first? Yeah, why don't we do the motion first? Do you want a slightly thorough one? I... I think it may be appropriate to do a motion to... I, I think I'll go this. through this very quickly. So okay, now, sure. Um, <clears throat> I move we accept the 729,000 Maine Department of Transportation grant for the Shore Road Pathway. Gratefully acknowledge and accept the donation of $100,000 in private donations collected by the Safe Access for Everyone <coughs> and approve the project funding as follows. Uh, Maine Department of Transportation grant 729,000, town center sidewalk account 60,000, balance remaining of July 2010 funding 26,000, PAX credit program 40,000, projected local donations from SAFE 100,000, infrastructure improvement fund 75,000 for a subtotal of 1,030,000. Uh, and finally, I move we authorize the town manager to locally administer the project working with the Maine Department of Transportation, including all acts necessary to complete the project within the total authorized amount. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Okay. Frank, second. Uh, any discussion? Jim. Uh, just a couple of questions, uh, maybe for the manager. Uh, when, when this uh, project was first brought forward, you know, some of the discussion about um, the amount of dollars involved were there any conversations about the sidewalk account being used as part of the process, or for that matter, the infrastructure um, improvement account? Were those ever on the table um, in, the, in the public way so that people understood that the dollars could, in fact, if necessary, come from those accounts? Go ahead. Yeah, I know the town center sidewalk account was specifically mentioned, because, of, particularly because of the piece. As it, as it does link to the town center. Uh, I, I do not recall the infrastructure improvement fund being specifically mentioned, although it was, it was set up for municipal infrastructure. And when, when it was set up, it was specifically, it was actually looking at the town center sidewalk as a way of trying to accomplish that. But, but I can't say it was, it was specifically set up. It was specifically mentioned in terms of the show road pathway. I do, do not recall it being mentioned. And second question, David. Um, if this goes out to bid, um, and I assume that it will, and it comes back at less than what we've authorized today, what, um, what, uh, what is the position the town will take relative to how the monies are utilized? Yes. Yes, please, Mike. The, uh, I assume it was part of the, the motion, although it wasn't specifically read, is that any balance left in the fund would revert back to the infrastructure improvement fund. And, and clear that up. I appreciate that. And I'm sorry uh, to interrupt, Sarah. Would you accept that addition yeah. to your motion? Sorry, I skipped that part. Yep. Okay. And uh, Frank, is that acceptable to you as a seconder? Okay. Frank, you had a question? Yeah, I started with two questions. Uh, Mike, just to clarify, the funds that are coming from the town, could they be used for any other purpose besides this type of infrastructure purpose? In other words, I think there have been some suggestions that we should use it to reduce taxes, but my understanding is that's not really possible. The, the infrastructure improvement fund was established to, to fund municipal infrastructure. Uh, the town does have the right, the town council, to dissolve that fund if it's so desired and to have the monies go elsewhere. So that, that you could conceivably do that if that was the desire of the council. Second, second question. Mr. Silva suggested that we give the committee uh, until October to raise additional funds. What would be the implications of doing that? Yeah, and I had the same yeah. uh, question, Mike. The, the real danger is, is when we, we looked at every two years, the, the Maine Department of Transportation <laughs> uh, funds something called the Biennial Transportation Improvement Program, the BTIP. As, as we looked at this particular program, this particular grant, we were the only project funded statewide for full construction, the only one statewide. 
There were others that, that got some amounts to keep projects moving forward. We were the only one statewide. I can remember uh, the state actually funding, not to bring back bad memories, uh, they gave us a grant for a traffic light at the town center once. It later got pulled away as, as issues happened. There was, there was a tr the, the original traffic light uh, down at the corner of Spurwick and Route 77, the same thing happened. There's a real danger with any main department transportation project that if you're not showing forward progress, that it may be pulled. The state, the, the new commissioner of transportation, from, from what I've heard, particularly through PAC sources and through MDOT staff members, is very, very upset that there's a lot of money that they've, that they've awarded that people are slow to, to make it happen. Uh, so, so the real worry and fear is that if, if you don't act fairly quickly, uh, you, you're leaving yourself open that your funding gap could end up to be a lot more than the 75000 and you know, you'll give or take the other dollars that reasonable people can, you know, I think we can all say, you know, that there's, there's some flexibility. The, the draft motion shows some flexibility in, in bringing resources to the table. Good. Are there any other questions? Jessica? Yeah, I've got several. I mean, I, I've you know, been reading through this, and I, I did not support, personally, the Shore Road pathway. I, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be a reality, and, I, and when it is, I certainly want it to be successful. Um, but, and I've, I've gotten some emails from citizens, um, and I want to bring up their point, and which is my point again as well, is that my understanding also was the deal was $200,000 from private funds. Now, and I, I appreciate what you know, Mike is saying about MDOT. I was wondering if uh, in the town budget, um, in Revenue 336, there's an MDOT block grant that shows $60,000 in that. Is that something that could be used? Or what is that for? I was trying to look through the budget today, and of course my internet was all down, so I couldn't, I couldn't that send you a question. Already, that money is, is in fact being used to reduce property taxes. Okay. That. It's, it's, a, it's a projected revenue that reduces property taxes. Okay. My other question is, and um, I've asked uh, item 92 to be tabled till June, but there, there were plans for continuing sidewalks in the town center from uh, Shore Road along the town hall and ultimately to Old Ocean House and Fowler. So, you know, my concern about using that amount that's why I was looking at that MDOT grant money, because when I look at our 60000 for town center sidewalk account, I'm thinking, well, gee, you know, what are we going to do when we look at continuing in the town sidewalks as, as was originally planned? I mean, it was kind of tabled during the town's uh, intersection situation, but I, you know, I'm just concerned as to where those funds will come from someday as we, as we discuss that. Isn't there, isn't there a line item? That is sidewalk improvement. We budget seventy thousand dollars. Well, why don't I ask the town manager to respond to Jessica's question? Yes. Uh, the town center sidewalk plan is part of the town center master plan. Uh, the town center master plan was adopted, I think, in 1991. Maybe it's about 20 years old. At that point, the sidewalks were were greatly improved on. Uh, along Scott Dyer Road, in front of the schools, and across the street here from the town hall. Uh, money ran out. Uh, it was then in the 2008 bond it was going to be done. The recession hit, and you know the the it's not only sidewalks; it's drainage. It's very expensive, and it, you know I think if the town had moved forward at that point, uh, uh, you know even though we don't have a recall provision for the council, it might have happened <laughs> or an attempt at it. Uh, you know, that the public wasn't in the mood to spend those monies. You know, the, the, there is no funding in, in, of the, it's, it'd be a million dollars to, to uh, really fully implement the town center sidewalk project. Uh, you know, and that includes going down to Fowler Road, which is the expensive part, down beyond the high school driveway, and then you know, there's always been an issue of what you do in, what you do in front of the shopping center. And it, originally the plan had the sidewalk on both sides, but now that the land the land trust, you know, that land's not going to be developed for commercial purposes. It wouldn't seem to make much sense. But it's, uh, there's, there's, there's not the money to do that, and there probably won't be for a long time. 
uh, you know, with you know some money's the sidewalk. But you know, I was down at Fort Williams before this meeting, and a citizen cornered me. Why is why isn't my sidewalk been fixed? So, you know, there's always going to be sidewalks that need work. Mr. Chairman, yes, go ahead, Jessica. I would be interested in asking the treasurer, Mr. It's Jim. Was it Carney? Carney. Could I? Could he come to the podium for a question? Or would that be okay? Or. Well, uh, or, well, I, well <laughs> how does the council feel? I mean, uh, uh, it, I mean, because I've got a question about further fundraising, uh, um, and I, well, I'd, my I'd like to ask. My understanding would be that their goal was to get to the hundred thousand dollar mark should this uh, motion carry today. Uh, so my understanding also would be that there would not be further fundraising, and Mr. Kearney's nodding his head. I suppose if the council didn't pass this motion, then there would be a different discussion. Okay. Well, then, because my, my other concern hearing from other, you know, fiscally conservative citizens in town was that if, if they were to raise 200000 I mean, that was what many people thought was the, the plan, um, then, then I, would, I would hope that they would continue, if, if at all possible. Um, I mean, if, if we vote this, I guess there won't be a need. but. But I just wanted to know. I, so I guess it's going to just stop at this point then. Well, I, again, I, I would assume that it would stop. Uh, on the other hand, if uh, another $50,000 fell into their lap, um, I mean, I don't mean to be flip, but if, if more money came in than was expected, I, I, I assume we could have a conversation about how we handle that. Um, but my understanding is that at least if I were in a private fundraising group and the full funding was then available, I, would, I, would, stop. I would stop. Yeah. So then, um, so just to be clear, there are no uh, funds in this list that would be po possibly used to offset pro property taxes, because that's a concern as well. So is that correct, Mike? I mean, this, the, the MDOT uh, grant that I mentioned, 326, would be, but nothing here would could be used elsewhere to offset property taxes. I'll let the town manager respond to that. I, I thought there was the. No, you, you, you can always say that if, if you said the project's not going forward, mm -hmm. we're not doing it, the 26000 that's left in the account would then be, you know, would become available for reallocation. Mm -hmm. The tax credit would not, the safe money would not, and the sidewalk money would, you know, it would be up to the council to do that. Yeah. So, you know, it, it could revert to some of the purpose, some of it, but, but you would lose the, the $729,000 grant and the $100,000 contribution. You'd lose $829,000. Uh, Sarah had her hand up, and then Caitlin. Um, <clears throat> I, just backing up to speak to the larger issue for a moment. First of all, I'd like to say I never, I never committed to it being 100% funded by either grants or private funding because I never thought that was going to be viable. In the back of my mind, I always assumed there would be some small portion that the town would have to help with. It generally goes that way in projects. I think of the, the, the turf that they raised over a million dollars and then were so tapped out at the very end, we contributed 150000 to finish the project. I thought that that was a win-win deal because we got a, a million-plus project for 150000 and I'd like to look at this project the same way. We're focusing very much on this relatively, if you look at the size of the project, quite small amount that we have to throw in to finish a very large deal. And the way I like to look at it is we're getting a million-dollar incredible pathway that we've been trying to get for... I don't, 25 years. The last iteration was when you mentioned 06, but this has been come before the council again and again. I think it started in the late 80s or 90s. My impression is the vast majority of the town is yearning for this. And I consider this the best bargain I've seen in a long time. So I will vote in favor of it, despite the fact that a very small amount will need to come from a fund that's already allocated, will not take immediate tax dollars. So I guess that's my feeling. Right, thanks, Sarah. Caitlin, did you have your hand up? I just wanted to echo what Sarah was saying. I've lived in town of Cape Elizabeth my entire life, and I've always considered Shore Road to be probably the most dangerous road in the town. And while no road is ever going to be safe, this is certainly going to make Shore Road a whole lot safer. And I think getting $729,000 
to do that, and all we have to do is maybe spend 75000 from an infrastructure improvement program as a contingency. So if that money is not needed, it will go back into that fund and it won't have been touched. I think it is well worth putting this road, this pathway in to have some form of safety increased in the shore road. Thanks. Thank you, Caitlin. Are there any other comments or questions? Okay. Uh, the motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor of the motion? All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. We'll just uh, let the chambers clear out and then we'll resume in a few minutes. If you, if you could just clear out so we can resume. We're not insulted that you're sticking around to watch, you're not sticking around to watch the rest of our meeting. Uh, uh, I want to thank all of the folks who've worked so hard on this project. Uh, this is a very exciting time for our town and, and even the folks that, who have been opposed, uh, who have ultimately supported it, I uh, appreciate that as well. Uh, item 29, excuse me, uh, I need my reading glasses, 89-2011, the In-By-The-Sea Liquor License and Special Amusement Permit. It is recommended that we approve the Malt, Venice, and Spirituous License for the In-By-The-Sea at 40 Bowery Beach Road, and also the Special Amusement Permit for Dancing and Entertainment. Uh, is there a motion? There is a motion. Second. Seconded. Any discussion? Yeah, I've just got a question. Go ahead, I was just surprised that one needed a dancing permit. Um, <laughs> does anybody know why? Have you been dancing? We're, in, we're in New England. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. I'm just like, curious. Know. It's state law. It's the state law. <laughs> Do you need a dancing permit? <laughs> Maybe I should. Uh, that's required when you have liquor served on the premises. Uh, we learn something new every day. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, all those in favor of the motion? Okay, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, the appointments committee. Uh, Jessica, could you uh, yes, uh, yes. Us for the council? Yes, I'd be glad to. Um, we are recommending Jessica D. Simpson to the, to the recycling, recycling committee for a term extending to December 31st, 2012. Heartily. And is, are you uh, making a motion then? Yes, I'd like to move that we recommend her to the recycling committee. All right, thank you. Second. And the motion's been seconded. Discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, the Fort Williams, excuse me, item number 91-2011, the Fort Williams Park use request. The U.S. Coast Guard aids to navigation team change of command ceremony. Uh, uh, the proposed date there is July 15, 2011, and the Arthritis Foundation walk. The proposed date there is September 25, 2011. Is there a motion? So moved. Okay. Okay. Uh, any discussion? A yes, quick Caitlin. question. In the um, proposal, it said possibly June 25th or September 25th. Is it firm that it's September? I was just reading the materials. I thought it said possibly June 25th. Okay. For the uh, postcard? The Arthritis Foundation oh, the, uh, Walk. Thank you. Mike, is that date firm for the Arthritis Foundation Walk, September 25th? I'd have to look. Can you... Uh, I'd it, in, in the letter, yeah, I, you have the letter, Caitlin? It I says that I'm interested in the morning of June 25th or September 25th in parentheses. Could we uh, amend the motion to allow both dates? 
who made the motion? Jim. It's so amendment. Okay. And you accept that accept the amendment? Answer. Okay. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, any other questions or comments? Okay. All those in favor of the motion as amended? <coughs> motion carries unanimously. Right? Okay. Anybody opposed? Okay. Everybody voted in favor of that, correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Did you vote? I did. Okay. All right. People were quick on the uptake. Uh, item number 92-2011, this is the Town Center Review Report update. Jessica, did you want to make a motion? Yes, I move that we table item 92 until the June Council meeting. And, once it, and is there a second? Second. And once there's a tabling motion, then there's no discussion. Mm -hmm. We just will vote. All those in favor of the motion? All right, the motion carries unanimously. Um, item 93-2011, the Central Main Power easement. Uh, as part of the update of the Spurwink Avenue treatment plant and pump station, Central Main Power needs easements on municipal property. Uh, so at this point, we would entertain a motion to authorize the town manager to execute those and easements. And it's going to form uh, to be approved by the town okay. Is there a motion? Okay. Did you get that there? I did. All right, thank you. Uh, is there a second? Thank you, Jim. Any discussion? Questions? Can I, is this just a temporary easement or it's just oh, oh, an always easement? This is an always easement. <laughs> Fairly common, isn't it, Mike, for it is. CMP to? It is. Okay. Any other questions? All those in favor of the motion? Opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Item number 94-2011, the Community Services Advisory Commission Work Plan. Uh, it is recommended that we receive the 2011 work plan for the Community Services Advisory Commission. Is there a motion? Sarah? I move we receive the 2011 work plan for the Community Services Advisory Commission. I'll second. Jessica seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Motion carries unanimously. Um, Let's see. Uh, do we, before I get to item number 95, 2011, with, which is an executive session request, oh, I'm sorry, here it is. This would be an opportunity for citizens to discuss items that are not on the agenda, however, it appears that chambers have cleared out. So uh, we can then move to the last item, which is 95 2011, uh, an executive session request. Is there, do I have a motion? So moved. Uh, so you're moving that we go into executive section in conformance with one MRSA section 405-6C? Correct. Seconded. The town manager has me well trained. I think we're supposed to <laughs> reference the statute. Um, any discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Okay, so we will go into executive session. Uh, we will go off the air now. Uh, when we adjourn the executive session, we'll come out and adjourn the meeting. Okay, thank you. Thank you.